Okay, listen to this. This is the tape I found downstairs. It has been a number of years since I began excavating the ruins of Kandar. I remember my first brush with the Necronomicon Ex Mortis. I was probably about 10 years old and it was a cool October night. I had been on a horror movie kick since after I watched the Friday the 13th remake that summer. Naturally, I made it my mission to watch as many slashers as I could. My father made that very easy for me with our Netflix subscription. This was back when you used to get DVDs in the mail and streaming was in its infancy if it even existed at all. He would let me rent whatever horror movies I felt like watching. <laughs> He'd even make suggestions. But that night stood out to me. We had just gotten two absolute knockouts. Toby Hooper's seminal classic, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Sam Raimi's The Evil Dead. I watched them both that night, back to back, in my room. My reaction was... I mean, it's all right, like... Overrated as fuck, in my opinion. Texas Chainsaw wasn't bloody enough for me to even call it a massacre, and Evil Dead was too weird and too cheap looking. Overall, different from anything I had seen up to that point. I remember feeling a bit dirty and unsatisfied after my first viewing of each film, like I saw something I wasn't supposed to see. Looking back now, I can say it was one hell of a double feature, as both these films are in my top 10 horror films of all time. Now we skip to the fall of 2012. I'm in my ninth grade math class, waiting for the bell to ring. I pop my headphones in and scroll through YouTube, and that's when I'm graced with all my favorite YouTubers talking about a new Evil Dead movie trailer. Being a few years older and just now starting to understand the true art of filmmaking and the challenges of making an independent film, I was interested to see an updated version of a movie I remember not liking too much. Needless to say, the trailer blew me away. I had chills at the imagery of Mia in all her dead-eye glory. With my excitement for the new film came a curiosity to revisit the original and maybe even check out the sequels I completely disregarded. So I sat down and popped Evil Dead back on and boy, was I surprised. Suddenly I could see the film for what it was, a low budget horror feature that oozed passion and determination. It felt like something that I could make with my friends but with a little bit of that movie magic we all strive to achieve. My love for the film grew as I began to look into its history and got to understand who Sam Raimi was besides the guy who directed the Spider-Man movies. Soon after, I made up my mission to see the other two films, and when that was done, I was a bona fide Ash Williams and Deadite fan. Hail to the king, baby. So now with the 2013 film just a mere weeks away, my anticipation was sky high. I convinced my dad to not only take me, but a whole group of my friends to go see the flick on opening night. When the lights went dark and the film started, I was absolutely shocked, disgusted, and exhilarated by what unfolded before me. They had done it. They had made a worthy remake to an all-time classic. I would leave that theater knowing two things. Fede Alvarez was a true master of modern horror, and I could not wait to see what the next Evil Dead film had in store for us. No secret, if you've seen our shorts, if you haven't, I'll just say it right now. Uh, I've been very excited for this, really looking forward to it. Uh, I mean, this is a franchise that I love to death. It's very close, near and dear to my heart. Uh, I got to say it's in my top three. Uh, okay, so that did take a bit longer than anticipated. And it's not really a continuation, but more of another take on the Evil Dead formula. Yes, I know Ash vs. Evil Dead had three seasons in between Evil Dead 2013 and Evil Dead Rise. We'll cover that. Just stick with me. So with this being the next step for the Evil Dead franchise and us only being days away from its release, I figure now would be the best time for us to sit down and discuss the series, and why I think it's not only the most creatively enriching series in the classic horror space, but also a near perfect example of how to evolve your story while keeping continuity intact. For the most part. Oh. oh god! No! No! I slept too long! Oh. Oh. 
So grab your chainsaws and hop in the Delta. It's time we dive deep on what could possibly be the greatest horror film series ever made. It all starts with 1981's Evil Dead, written and directed by Sam Raimi with the help of longtime friends Rob Tappert and Bruce Campbell. The trio had shot a short film called Within the Woods that loosely sums up the story of Evil Dead. This would be the trio's proof of concept to attempt to sell Raimi's script. This short would succeed and net the group $90,000 to make the film. And with that, they set off and would be on a long, arduous and grueling film shoot in the backwoods of Michigan. But after all the pain, delays, and hardships birthed a seminal classic that would go on to inspire and haunt generations for years to come. The story behind the making of this film is truly essential to anyone who wants to get into filmmaking. I implore you to look up as much as you can about what it took to put this film together, because it was tough, believe me. Now let's kick things off. Evil Dead follows a group of five friends as they make their way to a cabin in the northern Michigan wilderness. While staying at the cabin, they come across a strange book along with some recording equipment. When they play back the tape, the speaker, Professor Nobi, recites the incantation to summon an ancient evil which begins to take hold of each of the friends, turning them into demonic entities known as Deadites. Our lead character, Ashley Williams, who goes by Ash, is put through a tough situation as he now must dismember and destroy his friends, girlfriend, and sister before they can turn him into one of them as well. It's a very simple concept layered with well-constructed lore and relatable characters. The filmmakers knew they didn't have the budget to create flashy effects and big set pieces, so they spent the time making us fear the Book of the Dead and the horrors that it can create just by uttering a few key phrases. That's not to say the film is effectless, far from it actually. It has quite a number of convincing, albeit dated, special effects that still turn your stomach today. It's a part of independent horror history and has gone on to inspire many other first-time filmmakers to take the dive and make their movie, no matter what roadblocks lay ahead. So that leaves us with the timeline, and of course, Evil Dead starts it all. This movie can be looked at in a few different lights. It's a simple scary cabin tale where Ash is dispatched by demons in the end and the credits roll closing the story forever. Or with the sequels coming into play, you can look at this as the first domino to fall, setting off a chain reaction responsible for the events we're going to bear witness to. Let's call this the OG timeline. And I guess now would be the best time to hop into what we're gonna be calling the main timeline, starting with Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn. Now, from the creator of Evil Dead comes Evil Dead 2. Dead by Dawn. Evil Dead 2 is a bit of an oddball. Watching this for the first time can really throw people off because it basically restarts the series from square one, with Ash and his girlfriend on their way to the same cabin from the first film, but no friends along for the ride. There are two explanations for this. There's the narrative that I'm going with for this video, and there's the creator's explanation. And there's an odd thing about Evil Dead 2. There's a weird little trivia in that people think that Ash, the character Ash, was stupid enough to go back to the cabin with a new group of friends because the way it was retold, we didn't own the rights to our own movie that was done by New Line Cinema. The second movie was done by Dino De Laurentiis. So we just shot a recap with different actors as though that was the recap, but people thought, what's with all, he's coming back to the same cabin? So if you really want to do it right, you take the first Evil Dead up to where the evil entity hits me, cut off all the recap, go right into Ash being thrown through the trees at the beginning, lands, play the movie. It would all make perfect sense. It's truly unfortunate that Raimi and team didn't own the rights to their own movie, but if they learned anything from making this film, it was that limitations breed creativity. 
So they shot a recap, but instead of incorporating all of Ash and his friends, they kept it simple and just made it Ash and Linda. So after recapping Evil Dead for the first 15 minutes, the movie picks up with Ash alone at the cabin, dealing with deadites as they torture and maim him. <laughs> Evil Dead 2 takes a huge turn with more of a comedic approach to the terror. It's still horror, but the events and the situations of the film have this absurdist over-the-top style to them. They adore the Three Stooges, and you can clearly see that influence in nearly every deadite that Ash encounters in this film. Between the recap and the change in style and approach from the first film, it's clear to me that Raimi and Campbell are trying to set Evil Dead 2 apart from its predecessor, but not without bringing some of the DNA over that made that film so special. That's why when discussing the timeline of this series, I like to think that Evil Dead 2 is the catalyst for the whole franchise. This is truly where the timeline shenanigans begin. So now that we're in the context of the main timeline, and we've ironed out the details concerning the new opening, and the change in style, let's continue our story. Ash survives his encounter with the Deadites, and continues to fight these monsters, he meets Professor Nobi's daughter, and learns more about what the Book of the Dead is. Through the events of the film, the pair end up opening a portal in an attempt to banish the Deadites for good this time. But there's one problem. Nobi's daughter is killed before she can complete the readings, leaving the portal open to consume everything and for something to come through. The Kandarian demon has taken a physical form and begins to attack the cabin like some kind of giant rotten apple creature, giving us an amazing practical effect. But this is where we're given our next clue in my timeline theory. In the flesh of this massive demon, you can see grotesque faces of its victims all spread about its body. And whose face do we see? Why, Ash Williams, of course. Now, what could this mean? Well, my brain connects the dots that this is Ash from the first film, who died at the end. He becomes a victim, consumed by evil, and is now a part of said evil. The film concludes with Ash doing battle with the Kandarian demon and getting sucked into a massive portal, leading him to fall through a multiverse of madness. I, I couldn't help myself. Sending him back in time to the Middle Ages. At the end of Evil Dead 2, we witness Ash dropping from the sky and landing in the Middle Ages. He's soon surrounded by knights, and even King Arthur himself. Seen as a danger, the knights decide to kill Ash, but are all interrupted by a flying deadite, who Ash dispatches with style. Of course, as Evil Dead is famous for, they retcon this. I don't know how I got here, and uh... Uh, uh, I'm not looking for any trouble. After the success of Evil Dead 2, Raimi and company would go on to make a few more features, including his underrated first trip into the superhero genre, Darkman. This would be another success for Raimi, and further cement his name in the Hollywood system. But the Evil Dead fans could not be silenced. They begged Raimi for another installment into the popular horror franchise, and Raimi was more than happy to give it to him. Army of Darkness was the next chapter in Ash's story, sending him back to the Middle Ages to fight Deadites and learn more about this Book of the Dead. While on the journey to track down the Necronomicon, or Necronomicons, yes, there's three of them in this one. Nobody said anything about three books. Oh, that stinking wise man. Ash is pulling double duty in more ways than one. By vanquishing the evil and getting him a ticket back to his time, Ash inevitably makes enemies with, well, himself, and brings rise to Evil Ash, who will raise a skeleton army to attack Ash and his friends. What can I say about Army Darkness? It's a classic amongst not only Evil Dead fans, but horror lovers in general. No! 
It's a beautiful genre blend of action, horror, and of course, more than a dash of comedy mixed in. Hey, son, telling you, I'll squash you so hard, you'll have to look up to me now. Hey, dumbass! Hey. In the end, Evil is brought to its knees, and Ash is declared a hero. He's given the ability to go back to his own time, that is, if he doesn't sleep too long. We'll come back to that in a second. Army of Darkness serves as an excellent climax for the trilogy. It's bigger, wackier, and overall a joy to experience from start to finish. You can see that Raimi and team are truly on fire by this point. They're pulling out all the stops and giving the fans and newcomers a memorable experience. Each set piece in the film comes directly from the mind of Raimi, Tapper, and Campbell. The pit fight at the start of the film stands out as one of the most badass fights in the whole franchise. The little ashes are equal parts scary and hilarious. Even the Harryhausen inspired skeletons at the film's climax are impressive and timeless. Now, there are some points of contention when it comes to Army of Darkness, specifically its ending. The original ending saw Ash being given a potion that will put him to sleep until his present day arrives. Unfortunately, Ash takes too much and ends up sleeping way too long waking up in an apocalyptic future. Universal deemed this too much of a downer ending, so they forced Raimi to shoot the S-Smart ending, which, in my humble opinion, is a better ending entirely. It's classic, funny, and a perfect way to end the Evil Dead trilogy. Lady, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to ask you to leave the store. As for the timeline, we have to use the S-Smart ending in order for my theory to work, so sorry to the OG ending fans. So where do we go from here? Well, if time travel and multiverse theory have taught us anything, you can't open a portal to the past with an evil book and expect everything to go off without a hitch, even if it did take a while to get there. As strange as this might sound to some, Evil Dead from 2013 is a bit of a comfort movie for me. Like I said in the intro, I saw this movie in a packed theater with my dad and a large group of friends. It really left a major mark on me, and something I saved from the intro to further illustrate my point on how important this movie was to me growing up was that this was the first movie I watched with my future wife. Evil Dead 2013 has a lot of special moments attached to it for me, so understand that although I may have some sentimental history with the film, it doesn't mean that I'm holding it in such high regard because of those memories. In fact, a lot of people enjoyed this movie when it hit theaters, and even more have gone on to praise it over the last 10 years. As stated in my intro, Evil Dead 2013 had an astronomically large hill to climb. It was going to have to please fans of the original trilogy, as well as satisfy the darker and more brutal tastes of the modern horror audience. But hey, Fetty Alvarez and his team pulled it off and brought us the darkest addition to the Evil Dead franchise yet. Why don't you come down here so I can suck your cock, pretty boy? Mia. Mia, you fucking idiot! Your little sister's being raped in hell! In this entry, we see our main character Mia meet up with her friends and brother at the infamous cabin. Their mission is to help Mia get clean from her heroin addiction. They fear that if they can't get her clean soon, she won't survive much longer. The group makes themselves at home, and we get a loose retread of the original film. They find the book, a passage is read, and deadites emerge, taking each of them out one by one. Mia gets the honor of not only being the first person to get possessed, but as the events of the film play out, she is reborn due to her brother's efforts and not giving up on his family. Just when it seems that Mia and her brother can get the fuck out of there and get help, her brother is attacked and sacrifices himself to kill the last of the deadites. But in doing so, he inevitably completes the ritual and Mia ends the film facing off against the deadite only known as the Abomination. After a brutal fight and losing a hand, Mia dispatches the deadite in a gloriously bloody fashion and walks off, her story being left in the air ever since. Yes, Evil Dead strays away from its more comedic elements on this outing opting for a more serious and lore-focused story, but I feel it's intentional. Fede Alvarez was quoted recently while promoting the long-awaited unrated cut of the film as saying that Evil Dead is a sequel to the 1981 original. Now, some might see this as just a spicy statement to get the fans speculating and get his movie back in the headlines, but if you watch Evil Dead, all the evidence is there. 
If you're an eagle-eyed viewer, you can pay attention and see that a lot of the same damage from the first film still remains in this cabin. And, of course, the biggest sign is that Ash's Delta is still at the cabin itself. So with that information, how does this affect our timeline? Well, if we go back to the first film and take it as just that complete story, we now have a continuation. 32 years later, Mia and her friends would wind up at the same cabin and unleash the Deadites once again. This does, however, leave people to probably be guessing, what happened to those people at the beginning? Where do they fit into all of this? There isn't really a concrete explanation for what that group was and who those people were, but I can pretty much guess that within 32 years, more people have stumbled across this cabin, and there's a good chance that it's just been kind of rented out, sold, passed on at auctions. Hell, maybe even those people at the beginning of the movie who were kind of fucked up and wrong turn looking? Yeah, maybe they have something to do with it. I don't know. There might be more story to tell there. Either way, I choose to see this story as the next step past the first film, leaving the main timeline intact and choosing to follow the path after Ash's unfortunate demise, making way for new heroes to enter our story. But now, I think it's time we head back to our main timeline and see what exactly happened to Ash after his blast in the past. I will probably spend the least amount of time on this segment of our timeline, not because there's anything bad about this show, it's actually the fact that it's such a good show and so heartfelt and such a love letter to hardcore Deadite fans that it truly deserves an explanation video of its own. What I can deliver are the broad strokes and how it fits in our timeline. Now, I wouldn't fault anybody who got on board with the franchise at Evil Dead 2013 for being a bit turned off by this show at first. It's very much a return to form for the franchise going back to its comedy horror roots. First thing I gotta do is see a guy about a book. There must be some spell I can say to undo all this. The other first thing I gotta do is some cardio, because my heart is jackhammering like a quarterback on prom night. You get Ash Williams back, but more in a legacy character kind of view. He's the old dog, the hero of times long ago, literally and figuratively. He's far from that horrified young man we met back in 1981. He's Army of Darkness Ash, but after the touring days have stopped and he's back to his old life. For some, this might be a turnoff, but what would you do after going through what Ash Williams went through? The simple life might not be so bad after all. But the series goes on to ask, does evil ever really die? In the most Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell inspired twist of fate, Ash himself unleashes the horrors of the Necronomicon during a drunken night of lust and debauchery. This, in turn, leaves it up to him and his new friends Kelly and Pablo to vanquish the Deadites, once and for all. Again, this series does a great job of opening the world of the Evil Dead outside of the cabin. We get to see Deadites and other evil monstrosities in a lot of unusual places, as well as meet new characters that become regular Deadite Slayers in their own right. Overall, it's a very well-executed continuation that if I had to use one specific phrase to sum it all up, I would say it has heart. At its core, it's a show about friendship. Everyone Ash has ever known or gotten close to has died ever since he came across that Necronomicon. And then that, he feels a bit like he's on his own. But this show gives Ash real companionship. Now, does this show have its flaws? Absolutely. Not every episode is a masterpiece, and... After some behind-the-scenes drama, it's clear some plot lines were scrapped and changed, which overall kind of sucks. But as a whole, this is yet again another solid entry in the series. As far as our timeline is concerned, this is the de facto ending of Ash's story. Unfortunately, though, it leaves off on a cliffhanger. The series was cancelled before they could definitively wrap it up, so the last we see of Ash, he's ready to deal some damage in a Mad Max-style dystopian future. They were clearly going to be playing with time a lot more as the series continued for its last two seasons. Overall, I think the best way to look at Ash vs. the Evil Dead is it's a fun, heartfelt love letter to Ash Williams and his fans. Bruce Campbell has been very open that he's done playing Ash, and the series needs to head into another direction if it's going to continue at all. Now, whether you believe that or not, it's kind of up for you to decide. As we've seen with many actors who have iconic roles, the last ride may never actually be the last ride. 
As a fan of Bruce and Ash Williams, I hold out hope that one day we'll get him back to slaying Deadites once again, but if this is his final live action portrayal of Ash Williams, then as a fan, I'm satisfied. The three seasons of Ash vs. the Evil Dead are what concludes his trilogy, and ends the main timeline. If you are a diehard Ash Williams fan, then this is the timeline to follow, for sure. But the beauty of this franchise is, even though Ash's story may have hit its conclusion, the Deadites still live on. Mom? Mommy's with the maggots now. What will be, will be. Now as of recording this video, I have not seen Evil Dead Rise, so I won't be able to exactly pinpoint its place in the timeline, but I still want to use this film to drive home a very important component of this whole video. So yes, I have dubbed this video as a timeline exploit. This is a very popular genre of video that's been going on for about the last 10 years or so. We live in a media landscape where everything has to be connected. So much so that just about every movie released in theaters is being called the start or the continuation of the next great cinematic universe. And I'll admit, for a while, I really enjoyed it. I like keeping the continuity contained, it was impressive, and of course the standout example of all of this was Marvel. But as of late, there's been a shift in these kind of movies. Suddenly, most films, not just in the MCU, seem to be more about setting up what's to come next and not really about what's happening in the current story. We've lost sight of what makes a franchise special and traded it in for paper thin stories with just a bunch of easter eggs bolstering it together. You see, that's why I think the Evil Dead franchise is the perfect example of how to approach storytelling. There can be a narrative through line over multiple films, but without sacrificing creativity and the ability to branch off into new territory. Through each and every sidestep and roadblock thrown at this franchise, they've refused to buckle. They remained flexible and they told their stories. They came naturally and didn't try to force a resolution. This is truly something that's become rare in our current age of cinema. So I can't say for certain where Evil Dead Rise falls on our timeline. I can take my best guess that it'll probably act more as a branching path that opens new doors to new stories and new possibilities. So looking at our timeline as a whole, we can see that we have two distinct paths. The OG timeline, which if you follow my interpretation, is simply just Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2013. Then we have the main timeline, which of course starts with The Evil Dead, leading into Evil Dead 2, then followed up by Army of Darkness, and capping off with three seasons of Ash vs. the Evil Dead. Now again, just to reiterate and make myself very clear, this is just my interpretation of these events. This is my headcanon. If this doesn't do it for you, and you'd like this to forever remain just a loose, ever-evolving series that isn't constricted by timeline shenanigans, then by all means, see it that way. That's the beauty of this franchise. Some might call it conditioning, but I don't know. It just makes my brain happy to try and connect things. And, you know, this could just add more gas to the fire that hopefully will culminate in an eventual Evil Dead multiverse climax where we see Mia, Ash, and all our other favorite characters fighting alongside each other against foes new and old. Bit of a pipe dream, yeah. But, man, that'd be awesome. No matter how you choose to look at it, one thing can be absolutely certain. Evil Dead is a franchise that has stood the test of time and shows no signs of stopping. Yeah, maybe it won't be a series that gets a sequel every two years, but I think there's something special about that. It makes that moment that we do get one more of an event. No matter what timeline you subscribe to or what your preference and style and presentation is, there is one thing you can't deny. The Evil Dead has a little something for everybody. And that's why I can say with full confidence, the Evil Dead might just be the perfect horror series. Thank you all so much for checking out Deconstructing the Deadites. This has been a crazy, crazy journey for me. I mean, I have literally tapped out my memory on my computer. I have to do a lot of cleaning after this, but yes, it is finally complete. You've now seen it, and this was a labor of love. It was definitely tough, but uh, as always with these things, I 
I had a lot of fun doing it, but also just, yeah, it's takes a lot. Um, you know, when you write it all down on paper, it seems like it's going to be a lot shorter than it is. Uh, and then you start getting into it and you start realizing the little thoughts and edits that you had were like, well, geez, I got to get footage for this. I got to get footage for that, but pay no mind. I'm just happy that you watched it. And, uh, yeah, you know, the last video did really well. We got up to about 15,000 views. I'd like to get this thing to 20 if we can. So if you could just please, uh, like comment, subscribe, you know, get this thing all out there, share this puppy and, uh, yeah, get it to any dead Eye fans, you know, or just horror fans in general. But, uh, yeah, guys, as always, we got a lot of great stuff coming up on the channel for you. We're going to keep on keeping on and, uh, yeah. That's uh, that's about it for me. So uh, until next time, I'm Dylan Newell, and uh, stay scared.